that you know Africa has a lost history for the use of psychedelics that stretches back to the cradle of humankind. It's not just that we, we use mushrooms in Southern Africa and no one knows about it. It's not just that. It's also that there's culture and history around these things. Sangomas use them not just for therapeutic or medicinal use, but entheogenic use. They use these mushrooms to achieve altered states of consciousness, yeah. to um, achieve transcendental states. And no one knows about this. And I was like, this is insane. There is use that rivals or that, that, uh, that mimics use in other parts of the world. Welcome to another episode of the Sort and Found podcast. I'm your host, Gareth Catesy, and together we'll go on a journey around the world of holistic health. I'd love to learn how to empower my own mind, body, and spirit. And so in doing so, I've brought on thought leaders and practitioners in the holistic health space so that I can ask the questions that hopefully you and I would love to know the answers to. This week, we speak to Cullen Clark. Cullen is a mycologist and the co-founder of the Ether Apothecary. Cullen is also a plant medicine enthusiast and has possibly stumbled upon the greatest story never told, the last use of psychedelics in South Africa. The story goes back way further than we were ever taught in school, and he's stumbled upon some profound evidence that really brings to life an untold story that has been missed from our history books. We talk about our own plant medicine experiences, how reishi mushrooms can be used as a neurotropic and mental performance enhancer, and we also speak about the future of psychedelics and mental health and how that's going to be distributed in the future. If you want to unlock your inner wisdom further, please be a part of our community and hit subscribe. Give the notification button a click and remember to comment. Comments are important. If you have a question, let us know. If you love the podcast, let us know. If it wasn't for you, you can also let us know. So this will help us grow the guests we bring on board to help. This will help us grow the guests we bring onto the channel to give you the power to take agency over your own health and life. So with that being said, I hope you enjoy the podcast. Thank you so much. That which you most need to find is found where you least want to look. Welcome to the Sought and Found podcast, your gateway to the world of holistic health and wellness. Thanks for coming on the show. Maybe Thanks. we can start with the introductions. Um, who, who is Cullen Clark? Thanks, man. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Um, yeah, I'm I'm very to be sitting down and chatting to you. So, um, Cullen, Cullen Clark. Um, I I think I, I I do many different things, but um, what a lot of people do know me for is um, my my prevalence in the mycological world. Um, I'm an ethnomycologist, so I study the indigenous okay. use of fungi in Southern African tribal people, which is the most amazing subject ever. I absolutely adore it. Um, so yeah, so m mushrooms, um, species identification, but then also my, my brand or, uh, the, the brand that I co-founded with my wonderful business partner, Ricky Ann, um, which is Ether Apothecary. That's, yeah, that's, that maybe, that's maybe where I started and that's maybe a good place to start because, uh, yeah, that's basically the beginning. That was my, my early adulthood, um, endeavor and it's still busy going with eight, eight years in and going strong, going super, super strong. So yeah, ether, ether and mushrooms. That's, that's mainly yep. what I, I focus on for now, for now. It always changes. So yeah, I'll see you in the future, but <laughs> the golf. What, what does the ether apothecary, am I, am I saying that right? Sure. Yeah. So, yeah, so ether, um, ether apothecary is, um, is a brand that myself and my business partner started in 2017. And we started out really, I mean, re really small. We were doing the, the markets and, uh, you know, making the most odd things, making soaps and bar salts and pretty much anything that we found interesting. Uh, we, we wanted to DIY and make and manufacture just to, to get our hands a little bit dirty and figure out um, what we wanted to do with our lives. You know, I had just come out of the corporate world. I was 22 at the time. And, um, what 21 at the time and just could not stand corporate work. It's, you know, it works for some people, but for me, it just didn't suit my soul. I was sitting in traffic every single day yeah. and getting home when it was dark and I just absolutely, yeah, I, it was atrocious. I didn't enjoy it. So I, I quit my job. Yeah, that's out, that's out on life, I think. Yeah, I think so. And 
you know, I, I had so much that I wanted to do and so much that I wanted to achieve that I just couldn't comprehend wasting my time there. So yeah, after a, a wonderful mushroom experience, um, which was my first dabbling into mushrooms um, of the psychedelic kind, I, I quit my job that next and Andy. Was that then? Oh, wow. Yeah. Was that done like ceremoniously or just in a group? Or? It, it was literally, I mean, it was probably one of the worst ways to do it because I was at a party and my friend came up to me and he's like, try these, you'll like them. And I was like, sure, you know, I'm, uh, I'm this young hippie guy, I'm 21, I got long hair down to like my, my belly and I was just like, you know, let me, let me give it a go. And it rattled my world. It just changed my full perception of reality and of what I wanted to do. Yeah. I've always... um. I've always wanted to be a force for good, a, a change maker, and um, I wasn't going to achieve that doing what I was doing. And yeah, the mushrooms ba basically helped me see that. They were like, you got to do this now. You got you to go. It's not going to happen unless you make it happen. So I went to work and I quit my job that next Monday. And yeah, I was, do <laughs> was doing super well, you know, in the corporate world and climbing the ladder like you're Where's supposed to. Were your parents worried about you? Did you tell your your mom, you know, I ate mushrooms and I quit my job the next day? Well, so so that's made yeah. me that that's a whole other conversation because I think you know I, I'm I'm privileged. <laughs> I'm privileged in the sense I know this is going to sound absolutely atrocious and terrible, but I don't really have family. Um, my my mom okay. passed away young, and my father left when I was a baby. So. Uh, sorry. No, no, it's, it's all good. So what that actually allowed me to do was realize that I, it was only myself. It's me and myself that can make things happen. That's changed now. You know, that's definitely changed with my, with my age and with a little bit of maturity. I've realized that the people around you are instrumental to making things happen. So at that time, you know, I was, I just wanted myself. I went out, I did it. And luckily my, my partner at the time, who was my romantic partner, Rikian, um, she also had this holistic upbringing. She, she wanted to do something, um, with nature and yeah, we basically sat down and we chatted and we're like, okay, what do we want to do? We think we want to make, at that point it was, we want to make stuff. And then it slowly started to change and alter into medicine. And then from medicine, it went into like extracts and yeah, eight years later, we employ a couple dozen people. We are making the most amazing stuff. We are the pioneers of the mushroom industry here in South Africa, which I'm really proud of. Um, and yeah, most Amazing. of, most of the mushroom products you'll see on the shelves, we, we will contract manufacture for, for people. So we have a laboratory out in the Eastern Cape and it's on, on Ricky's farm out that side. And yeah, it's, uh, it's a good life. I mean, it's a whole story that I could really unravel there for you if you wanted to, you wanted to hear about it, but so <laughs> uh, it's been the most amazing journey. It, I would not change it for the world. And with that, I've met the most incredible people, been able to participate in the most awe-inspiring projects, and I think also found a lot of myself in the process, which has been phenomenal. So yeah, I, I love my life, man. It's a good life. That's awesome. Um, yeah, to go back, how did you get into studying fungi and in indigenous cultures and specifically South Africa? I was kind of under the impression there's a lot of, um, I guess, psychedelic cultures that pop up in shamanic practices around the world, but it kind of missed the mark in South Africa. But, but you know what, how do you get in the history or did it? Have I missed? Uh, so, yeah, so that's, that's exactly why, why I do the research that I do. Um, and we'll maybe break these down systematically. So, so how did I get into, to mushrooms? And then I will, uh, segue into the yeah. most amazing story that has never been told before. And I, I hope that it will yeah. interest a little bit. So um, mushrooms, I was, you know, I went after doing my mushroom trip and having my um, my experience, uh, my transcendental experience, I, I quit my job and I actually didn't look at mushrooms for quite a while. You know, I had this, this perception that um, traditional Chinese medicine, Ayurvedic medicine, um, uh, indigenous South African medicine all focuses on on plant medicines on herbs and botanicals yeah. well I, I was very focused on that and you know Ricky um she she sort of backed me up there as well she was like okay let's just focus on this let's get it down and I was actually quite um adamant that our company wasn't going to go into the the mushroom space because I didn't see 
the potential there. I saw other people doing it and I was like, you know, let's let's stick to the the quintessential natural medicine, the stuff that's had histories that go back into antiquity antiquity. And yeah. I was so wrong, man. I was so wrong. So <laughs> after years of pushing it <laughs> um it basically happened in a forest. I was I was walking around and I've told this story many times. Sorry, let's just fly around here. I was walking around and um I was talking to Ricky um, and I was like, imagine if we could find, there's this amazing mushroom. It's this big red conch mushroom called reishi, the Ganoderma genus. And it's a beautiful specimen. And I, I've always liked it. I've loved the look of it, but I wasn't really like attached to them yet. And I was in the forest of the Eastern Cape because that's where we moved to. And we, we relocated our business that side. And I was in this forest and I was like, imagine if we could find this mushroom because Apparently, it doesn't grow, you know, too well outside of China or outside of certain regions. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. It's got an Asian sounding name. Like, I didn't even know we get it. Yeah. Exactly. So, so I'm walking in the forest and I wade into this riverbed and I check this giant tree trunk that's fallen over into the, into the river. And on its side is this beautiful specimen of varnished red orange lacquered bracket fungus and it just looked absolutely stunning and it took me uh, it took my breath away so i walked up to it and i grabbed it and i broke it off the tree i pried it off and i was absolutely hooked after that when you break off a mushroom for your first time when you harvest one it taps you into this ancient feeling this foraging feeling that your ancestors have done yeah yeah and you just you fall straight into that um, into that uh, that understanding of connectedness, and it was just it was just exquisite. I loved it, and I was hooked. So we brought mushrooms into our our apothecary, into our armamentarium. We started supplying mushrooms, and then from there it grew. You know, we started to um, look at extraction protocol and how companies were doing it incorrectly in South Africa because it's this this new emerging field. And there's not a lot of research in South Africa. There's tons and tons of research internationally, but not much going on here. And there's no yeah. standardization. Um, there's no quality control. And I was just seeing where people were going wrong. And it was just, it was hurting me because they were leaving so much on the table. They, they were doing these rudimentary extracts and selling them for these really high prices. And I just felt firstly sad for the consumer that the consumer is spending this money and getting an inferior product. But then also said for the companies that, you know, they aren't informed or they're not aware. So we set out to to really educate and to to try and pioneer this movement. And yeah, with that came a lot of investment into extraction machinery, into protocol, into books. I've written numerous books on these subjects and and we give them out free of charge for anyone that's interested. There's there's tons of research. And with that, you know, whenever we so we Yeah. What, what what is the difference between like extracting and I, I know in like you know like more Western medicine they isolate a compound and patent it and stuff so yeah like what what is extracting actually so w when it comes to mushrooms Just um, to back up slightly yeah yeah of course when when it comes to mushrooms and, and plants for that matter as well for for anything um, when when you're looking at the medicine at the 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 medicinal compounds the beneficial or therapeutic compounds. They're, they're for the most part locked behind really sturdy cell walls in the in the form of mushrooms that's chitin um you know roots have their own compounds as well um they're bound together really tightly barks and twigs and leaves all have different compounds that bind together to to keep them safe within the cell yeah. and if you are just grinding that down you're getting some of those compounds that can be leached out by our guts, our guts do have acids and they can break it down. Um, but for the most yeah. part, a lot of stuff that just passes straight through the body without being assimilated. So when it comes to extraction, what we're basically doing is we're using various different protocols to break the cell wall, to shatter the cell wall, and then use a solvent to, to extract that, to bring that out and then concentrate it in high enough quantities. Cause there's also the whole thing of, you know, these compounds are there and everyone speaks about these beneficial compounds like with lion's mane. Have you ever heard of lion's mane? It's pretty big yes, on the environment. Yes. So, so lion's mane is this amazing mushroom for cognitive well-being, for, for mental agility, for focus and memory. The compounds responsible for that are these really low molecular weight 
um, diterpenoids. They're these, these terpene compounds that are in very, very minuscule amounts in this mushroom. So when you just, when you just have it as a powder, firstly, it's not extract, yeah. but then also if you, if you're extracting on its own, you're only getting small amounts. So concentration is also a big factor as well. You want to make sure that you're heightening and, and bringing as much of that into the product as possible. So we, we've taken years to figure all of this out and we, we do it systematically and we, we make sure when we're supplying customers or, or companies, cause we, we white label as well. We're running them through the whole process so that they understand as well, because a lot of this knowledge is just, you know, it's, it's, it's taken for granted. No one, no one actually thinks, you know, the company that's making my medicine knows exactly what they're doing. And, you know, with the big boom in mushrooms, everyone wants to get into it, but, you know, doing the research takes time and takes effort. So that's where we come in. Yeah. And I guess, how, how do you make sure you, you're sourcing it ethically, um, sure. You know, how do you guys do that? Yeah. So that's also, it's a tricky one. It's a very tricky one because, um, you know, there's, there's also a lot of stigma on sourcing and where products are coming from. Um, there's a lot of pushback against certain nations. Um, just to speak blatantly, a lot of people feel very strongly about Chinese grown products. And that is primarily because of a lot of propaganda touted by, um, competitor nations. Um, some of it is true. There is a lot of uh, air pollution. There's a lot of uh, water and ground pollution. That's without a doubt. That's a fact. That is de definitely a fact. But um, there's also a lot of propaganda with regards to, um, you know, how things are grown. But if you're looking at where your product comes from, ideally yeah. you want to get from the nation that's been growing it for thousands of years. So Mecca from Peru. Why would you not want to get it from the mountains of Peru where it's been growing for thousands of years and the people know about it? So we try and source from, from places that have been doing it for thousands of years. But with that, there's a lot of strict regimens when it comes to like pesticide, herbicide, um, heavy metal content. So we do certificates of analysis for every uh, certificates of analysis for everything that we get in. But with that, we also, we, we do local sourcing as well. We've just started the most amazing project, which I'd love to tell you about. It's, it's with this company called Fairwall. So, you know, when you buy coffee and you see the fair trade yes. uh, certifications on there, there's another organization yes, yes. called Fairwild. And what they do is they help empower, um, emerging economies, help empower low income, um, individuals to, to wild harvest items, especially if that wild harvested item has a long history of therapeutic use in that nature. And, um, they are global, they, they're all around the world, but the most wonderful thing is that we contacted them at this pivotal point where they wanted to get into mushroom certification. So officially ether in little South Africa on the Eastern coast will be the first globally certified fair wild mushroom harvesting campaign for reishi mushrooms in South Africa and uh -huh. Eastern Cape woman, um, out that side, the uh, we, we set, we situated it within these two communities. It's the Haga Haga community, but there's Soto and Nyatha, and we're getting women from these, these villages in Yangas and Sanbomas to harvest these mushrooms because they are en masse in the forests. They, they absolutely love and thrive on hardwood species, primarily wattle, black wattle, which everyone knows is an invasive species. So it's rampant in the Eastern Cape and we can then cultivate locally we can we can get it from local sources with these women harvesting it it then stops import because almost i think it's like 98 percent of the mushrooms coming into this country are coming in from um from uh, foreign nations so we're doing it locally we're providing jobs and then it's also building this economy in south africa yeah. of mushroom that has this long history of use here in south africa which we can segue into now it has been used for yeah. thousands of years they call it the spindy and it also, just like China, it's got an ancient, ancient, uh, um, profile of use. We're just heightening that. We're just showcasing that and hopefully, hopefully putting South Africa on the stage for, for mushroom knowledge. So yeah, we, that's basically what we're doing when it comes to sourcing. We source from many different places all around the world, but we, we do our checks. We, we do rigorous, rigorous checks to make sure things are safe. And, and what are the, the benefits to, to reishi? What, 
what would uh, one take it for? Cool. So yeah, reishi, reishi is definitely my favorite. I'm sure that you can tell. And it's, you know, it, it's, it's twofold. It's because I got to harvest the reishi in, in the forests and that really solidified it in my, in my heart as a species that I am, yeah, I totally bound to, if I, if I could say that. Um, you know, I, I was in the forests pretty much every single week for about four years harvesting these mushrooms, breaking them off trees, hundreds and hundreds of kilograms of these mushrooms. And yeah, it, it definitely wormed its way into my into my heart. And for that, I, I really love these mushrooms. But on the flip side, they are really beneficial. And there's a lot of studies conducted on, on the reishi mushrooms. Billions and billions of dollars have been pumped into the, studying this mushroom. I absolutely am in love with reishi mushrooms. They are exquisite. And I've had the privilege of harvesting them in in the mass hundreds and hundreds of kilograms over the last four years and because of that they really are hugely important to me but then on the flip side these mushrooms are also really beneficial there are numerous studies thousands and thousands of studies with billions of dollars being pumped into them to research the the benefits of these mushrooms um the the main sort of model of how they how they help the body is um, as an as a, um, a a tonic medicine or as an adaptogen. I don't know if you've ever heard that term before, adaptogen. But yeah, yeah, they they basically help the body adapt to the stresses of life, and that those stresses can be physical stresses, mental stresses. Um, they can um, help to increase energy levels. There's also a lot of studies going into the reishi mushroom for its ability to upregulate the immune uh, immune system or the immune response, and okay. you know that, that is a whole host of different benefits for like cancer treatment, for um, HIV and AIDS, just for you know everyday uh, influenza, you know anything where the immune system is compromised. These mushrooms can really be be beneficial. We we we've had quite a few customers, but the one that sort of sticks out to me was this this one woman that was um, doing her, her cancer treatment. She was on chemo. And with chemo, that really um, affects your, your white blood cell and killer cell counts. And, you know, she came to us and she was like, I, I, I can't continue my treatments because my white blood cell count can't handle it. And we put her onto this regimen of reishi and turkey tail. And we got her blood work back about two weeks later from the, doc- from the doctor's. And her white blood cell count had almost tripled, which was really phenomenal to see. So she could go back. So, you know, we, we don't advocate for, for one over the other. As an adjuvant, plant yeah. medicine or mushroom medicine can be really beneficial in conjunction with Western um, uh, medicine as well. So, you know, there, there's a time and place for everything. And you definitely should yeah, take the medicine. That's what I was going to ask, like... Yeah, yeah, like is there a potential for a synergy between more like a more Western approach to to healing and a more holistic plant medicine based approach? I know, like um, my doctor, I recently did a podcast with. He's had a massive shift where you know he's he's got a way more holistic approach now, and he also is quite a punter of the the reishi mushrooms and stuff. So, you know, instead of them almost being at war with each other where can they kind of align and and help people like honestly heal and and better themselves Mm. well i I think you know the thing is why should we be at arms with each other um you know modern medicine has been invented or has come around for a reason it's it's hugely beneficial it's saved countless lives billions and billions of people have used you know modern medicine and have seen the benefits of them um, the only thing that I would maybe try and highlight is the fact that, you know, we, we take our medicine when we have an issue. However, we should be looking at this from the other perspective of why not take our medicine to keep us better. So that is the, the Chinese response. That's the, uh, the traditional Chinese medicine approach, which is you, you pay your doctor only up until the time that you get sick. Once you get sick, your doctor isn't doing a good job anymore. He's not keeping you healthy. And and that's a different way to look at it. We should be actively wanting to better our bodies. That's why we exercise. That's why we eat healthy. It's because we don't want to fall yep. into to the, you know, the, the issues of life. 
And the same should apply with our medicine. We should be taking stuff to, to counteract the toxicity of the modern world. You know, there's a lot of wonderful things. I'm a big proponent for, for, for life. I love, I love this, this life. I love people. I love the world. I love everything that we're doing. It's really phenomenal. The stuff that we're pushing, you know, technology wise and, and like socioeconomically wise and but with that comes a lot of downsides and people aren't mitigating those downsides. So that's maybe where we come in is to try and say to people, wait, take this to help you with your anxiety and stress instead of this, because the studies show that St. John's Ward, for instance, is equal to or better in most cases than medium to mild SSRIs. Um, so when you them up against each other, there's fewer side effects there's better response. Your body literally works better. And these are double-blind placebo-controlled studies. There was a study that was yeah. conducting for like 40 years. And it showed that time and time again, the St. John's Ward outperformed the SSRIs, the serotonin reuptake inhibitors. And no one knows about it. So what, what is the St. John's Ward? That, that's a very cool plant. It's this wonderful plant. It's like, this okay. is just the most incredible thing. You know, it's a weed here in South Africa. It grows along the Western Cape and it's just, it's rampant. And it's been used in, in Europe for countless, countless years. Um, it's used all around the world and it's gained a lot of popularity um, for its ability to help with depression and anxiety. I've used it. I, I know its benefits. Um, you know, I try, I try a lot of these things out and I don't claim to take my medicine all the time. Um, the worst when it comes to remember to take stuff. But, you know, there's a few things that that really do work that I, I do trust wholeheartedly. And St. John's Wars is one of them. And the studies back it up. So we try and say, you know, combine the two. Combine the two. If you if you if you cut your foot on a piece of iron, go to the doctor. You know, go and get that tetanus shot. Go and yeah. do this. But then, you know, while you're dealing with the pain, why not take something that's a milder analgesic that can help with the pain management instead of pumping your body full of things that can really be detrimental to your health. So it's benefits to both, you know? I think it's also that approach to like addressing the root cause of a problem um, and working with it in a more holistic and healthy way as opposed to just a symptomatic approach. Sure, sure. And I think the main main problems with the mainstream thing is you aren't educated on the potential side effects and harms and things that a lot of um, prescription drugs can can give you and and also the length of time so many people get prescribed onto SSRIs there isn't like a well try it for two three months yeah exactly. it's like a, a lifetime so if there is if there is a natural way that can help you and it's better mm. for your body I think. Definitely. Why not give it a try? But yeah, there, there is definitely a time and place for well, one hundred. Why? That's why I love documentaries and all these things coming out. You know, it's really shining a light on on stuff that's just been the norm. And you know, we shouldn't just take it at face value. I mean, you seem like you're around my age, maybe a little bit older. Um, and you know, we we grew up with this like pop punk music. <laughs> simple plan and some 41 and blink and all of these things and you know yeah well we all grew up like pushing against cut like the counterculture movement pushing against the um the the status quo and i think we we tend to forget about that as we age you know we we just fall into a rut but we should always push back always ask questions always ask why am i taking this why am i continuing yeah. to do this for four or five years when i could be using it to bolster myself and then handle it myself because our bodies are really adaptive. Our bodies are incredibly intelligent machines that can figure itself out. It maybe just needs a bit of help every now and again. Yeah, true. And uh, I mean, I've heard, um, I've heard on your other pod podcast where they referred to plant allies. Like, where do you think, do you think there's like a wisdom and intelligence behind plants in nature that is trying to assist humanity? Um, in various ways, you know. Yeah, um, that's an interesting one. I, I cycle between between thoughts, and you know, living in the modern world, we're all, all fall victim. Or I mean, not to speak on behalf of the entire planet, but myself, I fall victim to yeah. um, to to losing the connectedness um, that 
that comes with being in contact with these things every single day. Um, but when I am in contact with them, I feel so much better. When I'm when I'm out in the forest or when I'm out in the ocean harvesting sea bamboo or or different cups or when you know I'm on a trail and I and I see some plants and I know exactly what they are and I take them and use them. There's a connectedness that happens there, and that connectedness, like I said earlier, goes back millennia to to our early ancestors. So there's definitely there's some form of intelligence and that intelligence has been with man since the very beginning we've used them in conjunction with other things and we we've grown with them in terms of um them helping us achieve something it, it, it's an interesting one i don't want to sound too like gosh i don't want to sound mean or anything but but the world is inherently yeah. selfish and just run with me on this thought but like if we just take weeds for instance for instance pioneer plants the, the purpose of a pioneer plant like dandelion is to replicate, to, to go as far as it can. So then it, it goes with men, it attaches to men, and it goes in their bags, and they drop it off, and they take a chair, and it goes there. And so at the forefront of things, I think that plants want to replicate, they want to reproduce and, and be everywhere and spread their seed, essentially. That's, that's an inherent trait of, of pretty much everything on this planet. But there is the side thing. Just like human beings, at, at the core of it, we, we hear it. To, to reproduce and to, to, to keep growing and to keep learning. But then there also, there's also the metaphysical part. There's the part that's like, what's the actual purpose here? And definitely, I think the purpose is what we make it for the most part. For me, that's, that's yeah, a, for sure. a journey to enlightenment, if you, if you can call it that. Um, and there are definite plants that assist with that. Now, why do they assist with that? Why do they help us see those things? I have no idea, and I don't want to act like I know, but it's very interesting, very peculiar. Why yeah. these are so I think it's a... amazing at helping us. Yeah, it's an amazing mystery, really. Um, I, I do. I would like to go back to one of the greatest stories untold, as you said, like how far back does medicinal fungi and mushroom and plant medicine go back in South Africa and what, why has it kind of missed the map in terms of, um, people knowing about it globally? So, so one of my, one of my favorite questions and I love, I love telling the story and it's a story that, um, that will be told in full, uh, within the next probably two years. Now, it, it, it probably is best to maybe segue here into why the story is being told. So I, I set out on a, on a bit of a mission about four years ago. Um, and that mission actually came about because I, I was hiking up on this, on this mountain in the Eastern Cape. And I saw these little mushrooms, these beautiful little white mushrooms called Schizophyllum commune, the split gill mushroom. And I remember looking at this thing and I was like, I wonder if this thing is being used by by anyone because it's this wonderful widespread mushroom. It's it's probably the most prevalent mushroom on this planet. It's on every single continent except Antarctica, and it's an edible fungus. It's really tasty. Excuse me. Um, so I went I went and researched, and I saw that there were tribes in Central Africa that used it. There was South American uh, use. There was use all around the world, and I was like. Why on earth do we see stories of these mushrooms? And it wasn't just this one, it was other ones. I went and checked. Why do we see stories of these things everywhere else, but not here, the cradle of humankind, at the beginning point, if you want to call that, of, of modern, modern man? This is a, I don't know what you believe, but this is a very special place. I love South Africa. There's something magical about this place. But for some reason, the story isn't fully told. We know snippets of it. So I, I said, I was like, okay, why? Why is there no information? Is it that our people don't choose mushrooms? Or is it that no one's had the time or no one's bothered to look if our people use mushrooms? So yeah. you'll be pleasantly surprised to know that it's the latter. Um, I, I went to the university um, the free state because I have some connections there and I, I sent some emails and I, I chatted to people I was like please can you send me some documents on any and every resource that you have about medicinal mushroom use in southern Africa and they were like no we don't have anything because our people don't use mushrooms 
I was like, that's very strange. And I went to go and check books and I went to go and look at some manuscripts and I went to go and read documents and papers, scouring the internet, looking for information. And there is absolutely nothing. I was like, this is so strange. Why is this happening? So, you know, I'm in the Eastern Cape. I've got a connection to some of the, the traditional healers out that side. And I'm this young 25 year old man. And I'm like, I'm going to dedicate myself to something. Let me, let me spend some time to actually figure something out and, and put my mark down and say I've contributed. So I set out on a journey and I traveled hundreds of kilometers, spoken to dozens upon dozens upon dozens of traditional healers and Sangomas and Nyangas, hiked through the mountains of Lesotho for 80, 90 kilometers, been to pretty much all the, the Muti markets, spoken to as many people as I could. And what I've found is absolutely astounding. It's not just that we, we use mushrooms in Southern Africa and no one knows about it. It's not just that. It's also that there's culture and history around these things. Sangomas use them not just for therapeutic or medicinal use, but entheogenic use. They use these mushrooms to achieve altered states of consciousness, yeah. to um, achieve transcendental states. And no one knows about this. And I was like, this is insane. There is use that rivals or that that uh, that mimics use in other parts of the world. So um, if there's studies conducted on reishi on its benefits for, for depression and anxiety, our local people here use it for the same thing. They call it ispindi, which is the first time, so it's, these names that I, I've found is the first time that they've ever been written down. Uh, these names are now showcased. And, um, and and what is the translation for that? So is, ispindi means um, uh, kidney, um, and that's just because okay. of the shape of the mushroom. Um, now there's different forms okay. of this mushroom, but um, that's just one of them. There's there's also other mushrooms that I've, I've gotten some names for. And what I've seen is that when they use these mushrooms, they use them the exact same way that ancient Chinese, ancient Siberian ancient South American shamans, pretty much how ancient people all around the world have been using these mushrooms, but then also it mimics that modern understanding and modern research that's being conducted on it as well, which shows an incredible knowledge, an ancient knowledge of, of mushroom use that's just been passed down generation to generation to generation. The same use traditionally is the exact same use medicinally by modern scientists, which is just incredible. It just baffled my mind when I saw that. So I was like, this is so cool. Now, on on this journey, while I'm speaking to these people, I'm like, how far back does this go? Who taught you? Who taught you? Who taught your father? Who taught your father's father? And this story just keeps going back and back and back. So I set out on the second mission, wanted to see how far back the story goes. And... Again, I went back to the universities. This At this point in time, I was also in contact with Stellenbosch University, and there were some contacts at uh, the Zimbabwe universities up that side. And I, again, asked for some information because I was like, how far back does this go? And there's absolutely no writing. So I thought, if I'm going to find an ancient use of mushrooms anywhere, it's going to be in the rock art. So again, I went back to the universities. Yeah. No one had any information for me. Again, they were like, oh, people don't use mushrooms. So I was like, I know case in point that they do use mushrooms. I just need some proof that it goes back into antiquity. And they eventually said to me, they don't, but you can you can take a world at it and you can go and look through our archives. And I went and looked through the Witwatersrand archives, rock art archives. And I went through about 200,000 images twice. And it took me months and months to look through these images. Yep. And I didn't just find one image or two images. I found hundreds of images 
of what I believe and what others believe now to be ancient South African Sangomas, using mushrooms, holding mushrooms, exalting mushrooms, consuming them, and then even using them to access transcendental spaces, to, to morph and to change into animals, these, these altered states of consciousness that, um, that geologists or, or rock yeah, art. It, I think they're called therianthropic or... Exactly. So, so these altered states that these, these shamans or sangomas enter, these, these therianthropes, where they take on these, um, these, these morphologies where they are half animal, half human, now, for ancient, uh, for ancient times, or, or, or the modern understanding of these ancient times is that these people would be using ecstatic dance to, to achieve these states. Now, this amazing author named Graham Hancock, I don't know if you've heard of Graham Hancock, he, he's a phenomenal author yes. that speaks about, of, he speaks about ancient cultures, and in one of his books, uh, Supernatural, he speaks about these therianthropes, and he, um, he yes. postulates hypothesizes what could be what people could be using to enter these states and he he goes over plant medicines but he doesn't have any proof of these and i think i've found proof of mushrooms being used to enter these transcendental spaces people literally holding tiny mushrooms wow. putting them to their mouths and then turning into animals and no one has ever seen these before no one has ever documented these so i feel very privileged very honored to be doing this research and this all culminates in a book that I've, yeah. I've, I've called Mushroom Muti, the untold story of fungi in Southern Africa. And yeah, that's busy being written at the moment. There's still a lot of work that needs to go into it, but just so that you know, there is, there is worship of mushrooms all throughout South Africa, deities, um, that that are, are heralded that can mimic mushrooms or that look like mushrooms. So is a history there that we don't know, and I'm hoping to uncover it. And when you went and spoke to these traditional medicine women and sangomas, uh, was there a reluctancy to tell you? Is there is the whole thing shrouded in secrecy, or is it just like no one ever asked, asked us? No, so there, there is there is some reluctancy, and that just takes a bit yeah. of. A, a bit of um, a bit of work to try and build a trust and a confidence. Um, I, I've been at at markets, at multi markets, with with people literally spitting on the ground and and saying that they they don't want us here and they don't want to speak to me. But then five five meters over, I'll speak to another person, and this person will basically say that you know without someone documenting it, this knowledge will be lost because the young people are moving out of yeah. the village and don't want to participate in the ancient practice of um, of becoming a Sangoma, of of going through their, their initiations. So, yeah, I, I do receive some pushback, but for the most part, there's a lot of... Um, a lot of interest in what I'm doing and then also um, wanting to be a part of the, the process because it's it's not my book. I'm only the author and the the yeah. back of the book has has every single Sangoma's name, every single researcher that's helped me, every single um, yeah. professor that's participated in analyzing the the, the benefits and, and working out the medicinal compounds. Um, so I'm I'm just the just the mouthpiece for it. Uh, it's it's everyone else's story to tell. That's an amazing story. Um, how how far back do these rock art and cave paintings go? Like how how long is is like your your theory on how, how long have has have they been used this way? Sure. So that that is something that we're looking into at the moment. <clears throat> There's some of the art that is definitely in the in the thousands, um, but in terms of how far back it goes, I I have no idea. Um, there's a lot of art that's also been lost uh, with graffiti uh, being drawn over it, or people chipping away at the rock to take a piece of it for themselves. And yeah, unfortunately, yep. because of that, a lot of the work that was done on it was in um, the the 80s or the 90s, and all that I have left is photographs. Of them, not all of them, um, but some of them. So for for the ones that we can test, we we would want to test the okra to see the the age of it. However, it's very difficult to test uh, non-organic elements. So 
you, you can't do carbon dating on that. So it's just about finding um, something that we can test. But yeah, uh, that's where that's where my trust in the people that study the rock art comes in and taking their lead on that. Yeah. Soon as I know better, I will I will inform you. Um, but there's the idea of you know the rock art dates are always changing. Ancient civilization dates are always changing. So yeah, this might yeah. stretch. It might stretch back further than we think. This might be the beginning of it all. And um, yeah, that's... If, yeah, if you if you know anything about like Terence McKenna, no, no, as I mean, that's like yeah, yeah. I was about to say my my favorite. One of my favorite quotes from him is, uh, you know, nature is alive and talking to us. It's yeah. not a metaphor. Um, but yeah, I mean, because he wrote Food of the Gods. Um, yeah. So, and that's also yeah. like a, a hell of a profound theory, the stoned ape theory that our consciousness evolved from the use of psychedelic mushrooms over millennia, you know? Definitely, definitely. And that's a deep dive I would encourage everyone to do is to look into that hypothesis. It's a very strong hypothesis that um, that is gaining a lot of traction. Um, it, not, it might not be the yeah. full answer of why the brain size doubled in such a short amount of time, but it definitely could be a contributor. And if we have proof of ancient yeah, okay. using these things actually using them and picking them out of the out of the dung which i've got rock art of of, of dung based mushrooms um coprophilus mushrooms that are being picked and then consumed that could rewrite the whole history of what we know so yeah it's uh, it's interesting it's um it's in its infancy at the moment and i'm hoping that um i will have it done within the next two years so yeah fingers crossed yeah i've read um supernatural as well and it's it's very interesting when you start to look at all the different shamanic cultures especially the ones that have recorded use of psychedelics or entheogens yeah. in their cultural practice and how many of their ideas and conceptions and rituals and practices um like almost mimic each other you know that they were almost tapping into like a possible unseen realm or, or something to that extent um Sure. the use of these plants um but yeah like what let, yeah, let me uh, actually... when when these sangomas are using them yeah yeah so i was gonna say just before we get Sorry. off of that like maybe i can just ask you have you have you tried um the psychoactive mushrooms uh, would that be me prying too much uh to see if you if you have had uh, the old... I have. i've had a um more than a few uh, altered uh, yeah, experiences with altered states of consciousness. I've done ibogaine. I've done okay. yeah, um, obviously mushrooms and ayahuasca, and um, they've all had a profound effect on the way I view life and sure. death and God. Um, but yeah, I think the one thing that's like they open you up to an awareness that you are far deeper. And there's something far more to you than you could ever realize or comprehend. That's so, yeah. Um, and you, I and you can imagine see... picking yeah. those up back in the day, and you having some yeah. sort of a similar realization. And, and you could see why they would then worship these the, these um, uh, these medicines. You know, if if I'm an ancient hunter gatherer, I would I would definitely revere two things. I would revere something that feeds my family. You know, having a, a food source. That's why you know these kudu and yeah. these earlocks are all painted in the rock art. But then that's also why these mushrooms are painted in the rock art. Perhaps they yeah. revere more than we ever think. So, yeah, I mean, if you've tried them, you pretty much know why there would be this reverence. No, for sure. And I think it's a plausible theory because, I mean, in school, I mean, I remember being taught in school about the rock art and, you know, it's a altered state through dance or drumming. I think and, um, you know, that's why they would paint these things. And I don't know, I've danced pretty hard before. And, <laughs> you know, like, yeah. And I feel like those sort of uh, images or spaces are, are more likely revealed in a psychedelic yeah. or altered state of consciousness, you know. Exactly. Uh, I would be more than happy to share you sh share some of those images with you, and you can let me know what you think of them. There's there's people flying off yeah, into 
into into different spaces with literally streaks behind them and and holding mushrooms and people transforming into crocodiles and holding mushrooms and it's very interesting. Yeah. But maybe that that would be a good segue into something else that's really really phenomenal that's happening at the moment, which I'd love to tell you about. Um, which is yeah. my my first paper that I've co-authored with an amazing author named Brayton from Amava. Um, as well as some other researchers, um, one being Alan Rockefeller, which is one of the foremost authorities on psilocybe species in the United States. Now, psilocybe is the genus that these psychoactive mushrooms come out of. Um, there's there's also a couple others, but basically in, in my travels, I found a new psilocybe species um, and it's the first one in South Africa in 30 years to be found. And we, we wrote about it and we've published and it's busy being vetted now at the moment. And it's very interesting because it's an, an indigenous specimen that only grows here. And it's the first specimen, first mushroom specimen with an indigenous name in Southern Africa. So we, we decided to give it an indigenous name, uh, to to, to pay homage to the um, to the traditional cultures, which is really phenomenal. So, yeah, if, if uh, you're interested in the psychoactive side of things, there's a lot of cool research happening there. And Ether is also trying to be at the forefront of this as well, which is quite cool. So, yeah, that, that research will be published fairly soon so people can go and view it. Um, I'll release that on our Instagram profile. Where, where do you think the, the future of... Um... Maybe the use of, of you know, psychedelic uh, plant medicines lies because it's it's still quite a gray area with legality and stuff. But it seems like things are are moving forward, uh, especially globally. Yes. So yeah, what is what is the future of that look like? Sure. Well, if yeah, so, I, I'm on a, a few couple of committees and groups um, relating to like uh, the Cyberactive Society of Southern Africa and the Decriminalized Nature Society and. You know, on those groups, there's a lot of, a lot of optimism. Um, however, I don't think it's going to be as soon as people hope, uh, the, the legal change, yeah. um, you know, cannabis still isn't fully legal and there are, you know, lots of gray areas. So with mushrooms, I, I, you know, I predict maybe four, four or five years before we actually start to see big change happening. <clears throat> however, in the meantime, we do have some really interesting studies that are happening with uh, a few universities where they are testing these mushrooms, but they're very small case studies. Um, so, you know, we're, we're, we're dipping our feet into it um, as, a, as a nation. How, how I would like it to happen is that South Africa becomes known, you know, we're trying to pioneer this mushroom movement, but South Africa becomes known for its varieties of psychoactive mushrooms because we use the psilocybe cubensis, and um, as a resonance and all these other ones, the Liberty Caps from, from all around the world and mainly, you know, the United States and uh, South America. But imagine if we could be giving people mushroom medicine to treat their end of life crisis or their depression. Yeah. But the thing that we give them is South African medicine. It's from our nation, from our land. It would really be phenomenal. So that is where, where we're trying to pioneer a little bit. So we're doing a lot of research. We're, we're building out a facility down here in Cape Town, in Capricorn Park with some friends. Um, and this will be a research facility that runs a couple different companies from it. And there we're going to start some preliminary research on on these things. Um, so yeah, no, when it, when it becomes... Is it, is it focused at, at kind of, um, you know, end of life research? Um, so so the... Uh, multitude of stuff? The facility is basically an incubator for 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 brands and business because Ether, um, as a collective Ether group, um, has some phenomenal visions for for really bringing product to market that isn't currently here. And we're doing some really cool um, R and D on on things that people don't even know about stuff that's like really obscure that that could change people's lives. Um, so this facility is basically an incubator for building these brands up. Um, in terms of the research and development side of it, um, um, that part is mainly focused on cultivation because, you know, figuring that out, the first step, figuring out how to cultivate some mass, um, the patents that we've filed or that we're, we're wanting to file, 
Um, you know, all of those things are the first step. And then the second step is, is then looking how we can then help people with it. So, you know, my, my journey started and it sounds like a lot of your journey, um, with, with understanding yourself and where you fit into this. Yeah. My journey started because of a high dose of, of mushrooms and changed my life. And I would, I would want that for people that are ready to undertake that. I would love that for them. But a lot of the benefits is going to come from microdosing. That's where people are going to see a lot of benefits. Yeah. So that's basically where we want to go into. So um, we started that whole process. We I think read... that's a nice, it's a nice way to dip your toe. Toes yeah. Water, you know? <laughs> so so uh, boundary dissolving. Exactly, man. So, but unfortunately, it is still what, what's the schedule? I think it's schedule seven, if I'm not mistaken. I think that's how it works. So, it's on par with heroin yeah. and you know, and all of these things, which baffles my mind. So, you know, when people see these products it's out from crazy, yeah, yeah, un unfortunately, when people see these products out on the market, it is still illegal, um, which sucks, it sucks tremendously. Um, and because of that, there's no regulation around it. So, a lot of product that I've purchased or that I've tried. Um, just for testing and we test we test a lot of things on them um, they're pretty inactive at microdoses so a lot of the stuff on the market is actually inactive it's not doing anything then people say I don't feel any benefits and then the, yeah. the people feeling it are like no it's a microdose you're not supposed to feel it but when you actually get down to the testing in the core of it the psilocin and psilocybin content is almost non-existent so you know we, we're wanting to oh. get into a cultivation space to make sure that what we're growing is good quality and ether will forefront that we um, we've registered some very cool domains and some very cool brands. So we, we own basically the, the market for, for psilocybe in South Africa. And because of that, we've registered a, a company called silo and silo will, will focus on that and, um, we'll, we'll try and pioneer and, and set the stage for South Africa to, to really be, you know, be, be leaders when it comes to that space. Yeah. Yeah. That's an exciting yeah it's sure it's it's, I think it's it's a matter of time to be honest yeah definitely and it, it's gonna help so many people it's gonna help so so many people i think yeah it's also probably worth touching on I, I think it's an important one to touch on because i don't think like if there is a listener and you, you want to try a high dose for your first time there it, it is a challenging experience at times and you know i think that's the problem with um it being unregulated and stuff is there isn't a place where you can go to a professional um, practitioner or someone who's trained to handle those sort of spaces um, and and guide someone through like what could be a hell of a, a turmoil, you know? And at the same time, it can be incredibly enlightening and, and life-changing. And yeah. you quit your job, you say. <laughs> yeah, well... That, that's the interesting part um, is is that, you know, with all the positive stories that I have, I also have a negative story that's also incredibly important to my life. And it was probably the most important thing that ever happened to me, which was now maybe two and a half or three years ago. I I had the calling to to continue uh, my journey of 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 enlightenment or, or try and understand a little bit more but i i approached it with a lot of ego and a lot of mm. yeah a lot of the wrong emotions and i wanted to know and i wanted to know and these mushrooms basically showed me everything that i wanted to know but i couldn't handle it and it really impacted me negatively in terms of men mentally um it took me a long time to to write my mental scape um and it, it basically instilled this, um, this disorder that took me about six months to, to, to fix, um, called DPDR, which is depersonalization and derealization disorder where it, it uh, yeah. I don't know if you've heard about it, but it, 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 it basically made my life hell where I didn't know what was reality and it, it messed with my consciousness and my time perception. And I was just an anxiety spouts and. So it's not something that I would advise people just to do without considering very intently. It's not a light thing. And I approached it very lightly that, that time around. And that is why we have this ceremony around it. And this, you know, this um, huge history is because it needs to be revered and needs to be taken seriously. So if you're going to be doing a high dose, do it properly. Yep. Research, do it properly. Because otherwise, you could really do a lot of... 
I don't want to say damaged because it was also the most incredible experience. It helped me understand life and the stuff that I was shown, not to get too um, existential or, or, or metaphysical here, but the stuff that I was shown, I was allowed access to spaces that will forever change my perception of reality. And I would love to yeah. have another another talk with you about that because maybe you could share some stories as well. But at the end of the day, I would say that it can change your life, but you got to do it properly. Yeah, and I, I think if you, yeah, as soon as you come in with too high of an ego, yep. the, the universe or whatever you want to call it will, will uh, give you a nice backhand. I think it's also a Terence McKenna quote where he said uh, psychedelics are so kind to the novice and so yeah. unforgiving to the veteran. You know, as as soon as you think you know it or you overdo it, it will, it will knock you. <laughs> exactly, man. <laughs> Definitely, without a doubt, with that loving hand, with without it. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, I think I think that's a, a good place to wrap it up. So, man, yeah, I had a, I had a lot of fun. Can you tell a bit of the story? There's still so much left untold about like our team and just what we do and the brilliance that is actually at the heart of Ether and you know who actually runs the company on the day to day. Those people are so important and yeah. You know, People do want to know more about that. You can just follow our social media. You can see who's who's in the back end, who's responsible for the medicine that you take. Again, I would encourage everyone to go and check it out because it's very cool. Our 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 team is just extraordinary. Yeah, I'll post it in the in the comments below. Thank you so much, Kellen. It's been Matt, a very, very interesting conversation. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it.